only one God, and we know his name. The second thing is a physical thing cannot be divine, okay? A physical thing cannot be divine. You know, when Jesus walked the earth, he made a big deal about my father in me, my father in me. He himself was very much in the flesh and knew that he cannot be God, but God could be in him, and that's, in fact, what was the case. Once he's resurrected, that changes, uh, you know, because uh, he becomes our intermediary. But uh, it's very important for us to understand that a physical thing cannot be God. But people make physical things God. Indeed, Psalm 115, verses 4 to 7 the Bible says this, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak, eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear, noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. So basically, you know, they have all of the things that a human has, but they can't use them. There's nothing in there, right? The lights may be, may be on, but nobody's home. Even the lights aren't on unless they put a fire inside them. And this is what I wanted to say about false deities. Idol worship is merely worship of demon angels. Demon angels will, you know, I'm sure have impersonated gods and wanted to be gods. Certain, certainly Lucifer did. That's why he was thrust out of heaven, you know. But uh, the Bible says this. Paul was very clear about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 to 21, when he said, No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So any of these gods, these statues, if there's any any reality behind it, the the it's not God, it's demons. It's a demon. And that's Paul's very clear about that. That false gods are demons. If they're if they if there's any sense that they are, they don't even sacrifice them to their gods. They sacrifice them to demons because God doesn't receive that sacrifice. God doesn't receive that worship. You know, the common refrain we hear from so many people today outside the church is, oh, there are many ways to God. Well, that, that's not true. There are not many ways to God. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So there are not many ways to, the, to, to God. There's only one way to the Lord, and that's through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Give him praise. Amen. And uh, here I have a picture of, the, of, uh, of, it looks like it must be the Pope, or at least, uh, you know, he's kissing the the. The uh, he's kissing the looks like the knee of a baby Jesus, but it looks like it's a little higher than the knee. It's really disgusting, frankly. Uh, today in the USA, many people have been seduced to the worship of idols, despite knowing better. Right? I mean, it's the common refrain that we hear from people is that oh, it, we're not. I don't really worship the statue. It's just a reminder. Well, that's exactly what an idol is. It's a reminder of this false god you serve. So. You know, the, the bowing down before statues is a very much a no-no. I was in a church where the uh, the preacher put a uh, had a stained glass of Jesus with his arms outstretched and his hands, you know, uh, blood in the middle of his hands, blood stained like he'd had the he'd had the nails in them. And uh, I was very adamant about this. He put it behind the altar and put a light behind it. And I'm like, you know, really, when people come to pray, they're basically bowing down to this picture. That's not good. That's not supposed to be done. Uh, it's amazing that this young man had been raised in Pentecost, but still did not see the error of his ways. And that's why we have to be so uh, diligent about teaching this to our children, not to bow down to idols, because they don't mean anything, and they are nothing. And really, uh, it doesn't matter even if it's a picture of Jesus. We don't bow down and worship pictures or statues of Jesus. It's not to be done. The Lord's very clear about that. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's take a look at some examples of idol worship. I'm going to begin with Buddhism tonight, okay? I'm going to begin with Buddhism. And, of course, I have a picture of a Buddha on a lotus leaf, you know, uh, with his hands together, you know, looking so super spiritual. Well, let's look at the five tenets of Buddhism and see what they are. Um, Buddhism's five tenets are basically do not kill a living creature, do not take what isn't yours, do not misuse yourself or others. Do not gossip or tell lies. 
do not misuse alcohol or drugs. Okay, this looks good on the surface, but we have to pick it apart a little bit and find out what it's all about. These tenets sound good, but the language misuse allows a lot of things such as fornication, right? And, hey, you know, if I don't misuse heroin, I can take that. Uh, so, you know, you'll find a lot of Buddhists that sort justify their fornication because as long as it doesn't hurt them and the other person in their minds, uh, it's okay. Well, the Bible, obviously, one of the four commandments that was given to the Gentiles when they came in the church was flee fornication. I felt that was very important to, to stay away from. So obviously, you know, some of these, there's too much wiggle room in this. It's not like the commandments. Uh, also, the Bible tells us to flee fornication, so we're not going to do that. Uh, also, a Buddhist can take drugs and drink as long as he or, does, he or she does not misuse. All right. Well, the Bible's adamant about that, wants us to refrain from being drunk and asks us to be filled with the Spirit instead. Amen. Also, uh, Buddhists meditate to where the mind is filled basically with nothing. You know, they try to have good feelings and everything. But, you know, what are they meditating on? When you meditate, you know, the Bible talks about meditating, but it's in the Lord. Think on the Word of God. Think on Jesus. Think on these things. Think on the power of God. You know, let this mind be in you. I mean, when, when, when you meditate outside of that, you can invite demon spirits into yourself. You can actually get possessed by meditating uh, and not doing it in the Lord. Amen. Uh, the Bible tells us, as I said, to have the mind of Christ. We have to have the mind of Christ. So whatever we do and whatever we think of, we should make sure that we're focused on Jesus in our meditation. Amen. And Buddhists claim their religion is merely a philosophy. I've heard that before. They, oh, it's just a philosophy. It's not real, really a religion. Well, if it's not really a religion, then why do they bow down to a statue? And many, many pictures online when I looked up and trying to statue of Buddha, I saw many instances where there were people offering to putting offerings in front of Buddha and bowing down in front of the Buddha statue. I mean, if they're if if it's not an idol, then why do you treat it like one? And if you if your religion if your philosophy philosophy uh, is uh, requiring you to do that or encouraging to do that when, hello, then uh, you're worshiping a false god. And if you're worshiping a false god, you're worshiping a demon and you're inviting demons into your life. That's essentially what it is. That's idol worship and it's an ungodly and it's not to be done. Amen. All right, let's take a look at Hinduism. I have a picture here. I'm going to explain what that picture is in a little bit. But if you see it, obviously it looks pretty nasty. Uh, and I'll explain something about it when I talk about it. Amen. There are as many as 330 million gods in Hinduism. 330 million gods. That, that, there's a lot of demons out there. There's a lot of demons out there. The Hindu believes that God is in everything and is everything, that the God is in everything and is everything. That's what they believe. Okay, what's that called? That's called pantheism. Pantheism, it basically boils down to the worship of the earth, the worship of animals, the worship of things, and not the worship of God. Our Bible teaches us differently. God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, God was not in the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, so God is not in the tree trunk, and God is not in the rock. Uh, God is not in us until we receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, this is not something that the Hindu sees. They see God in everything. So uh, that and, and in everyone. And of course, you know, we'll talk about that in a second, a second, because they believe that the, the divine is in each of us. The divine is in each of us. That's what they believe. And also the Bible teaches us that creation is separate from God. Amen. Uh, there's another a thing called theism, and theism basically teaches that God created the world and then basically walked away and didn't bother with it, like like winding up a clock, wound up the clock and walked away. Uh, we don't believe that either. We believe God is providentially involved in the affairs of human beings and in the affairs of the earth, amen, because he's interested in, in all flesh to be saved. So in order to do that, God has to be involved in things. That's called panentheism. All right, now the Bible teaches us that we must be born again of water of the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. 
that we are not automatically born with God in us. And see, see how Hinduism has crept into the world. You know, essentially, this is the argument that the uh, LBGT gang is claiming for themselves. They're saying, well, I was born this way, and I'm made in the image of God. Therefore, God is transgender. God is gay. God is lesbian. God is queer. Uh, there's, this is the claim that they are making, right? Be, but they're fundamental. That's, a, that's basically a claim that comes from Hinduism, that God is in everything. There are other religions that believe that as well. Um, Celts, to a certain degree, believe there are spirits in, the, in, uh, in, the, in, in inanimate objects and so on. But you see, that, that particular falsity has really crept into the minds of people today so that they think that, you know, well, whatever they, basically what that means that whatever you do, it's okay because God created you to do it. But in fact, we do not have God in us until we're filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Bible, as I said before, teaches that we must be born again of water and of the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. Amen. We must be born, and we have to have a life change that is orchestrated by the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be completely changed, in order, hallelujah, to know that God is in us. And then what happens is we cease to become uh, queer. We cease to become lesbian. We cease to become gay. We cease to... Uh, to become transgender. Amen. We start to become Christians. Amen. And God reorders our minds and our hearts toward him to behave in a manner that he sees fit. Hallelujah. And that goes just as much for people who are promis promiscuous or uh, sinful in other ways. That you ha We have to be changed by the born-again experience in order to be God in us. And when God is in us, by the Holy Ghost. That's when the change begins to happen. That's when we become new creatures in Christ. Old things are passed away. Hallelujah. And this, that's a, such a teaching is so different from Hinduism. Further, John 3, chapter 5, 6, Jesus said to this to Nicodemus, as you well know, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So when we're born in the flesh, that's one birth, but the spirit birth is the, is the second birth. Hallelujah. But the Hindus would believe that that which is born of the flesh already has God in that. So that's not true. <clears throat> I've often said this before. If Adam and Eve had the Spirit of God in them, they never would have sinned. Never would have happened. They wouldn't have been tempted in the flesh. Now, pictured here, I'm going to explain this picture. This is the god Shiva. She's part of the Hindu trinity, okay? So if you look at this picture, she's got four arms. Or he, actually, it's actually a he, but he looks very effeminate, uh, which is probably very appropriate because it's a perversion. Uh, but he has four arms, and he has two legs. He's standing, on some, standing next to a couple and on or next to a couple of snakes, uh, he's got a necklace of uh, some guy's face, who knows what it is, and all these arms coming out from his waist. Uh, I guess these are military conquests. He has a severed head uh, in his left hand, the highest left hand, and he's got a sword in the right hand. He's got a trident in the lower right hand. Uh, and his tongue is hanging out in a disgusting manner. Uh, and he's got a headdress and a little crescent moon on it. So obviously this is a this is a demon. This is a picture of a demon and not of God. Actual, I'm sure there's a demon behind this. Um, this God Shiva can be benevolent or evil depending on the circumstances. And we know that our God is always good. Can you get, can you say praise the Lord? He's good all the time. Hallelujah. Amen. Our God is not evil. Cannot do evil. Evil is in Lucifer. Evil and good are not, they are not co-powerful. Good and evil are not, don't have the same amount of power. Good has all power. Evil's power is only for a time and will be done away with. That's why the whole yin and yang thing is very much a lie as well. Uh, good and evil don't have this coexistence going on. Uh, it, good is, oh, hallelujah. God is good, and, and everything he's done is good, and everything he will do is good. Uh, evil comes from Lucifer and from the hearts of uh, sinners. 
Amen. Clearly, the worship of such an idol is demonic, of Shiva, uh, for the very picture appears as a demon, or it just looks demonic. Amen. So people, uh, people remember, demons masquerade as gods, and if we bow down and worship to worship Shiva, we are worshiping a demon spirit. We are viola violating uh, the tenets of our faith. Hallelujah. So we cannot allow ourselves to fall prey to all that kind of stuff. Okay. Let's take a look at something closer to home, although Hinduism is very close to home now. Let's take a, take a look at another aspect of idol worship, which is Mary and the so-called saints. I have a picture here. It looks like the Pope uh, who's getting ready, just uh, bowing before this statue of Mary. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's looking all super spiritual and loving and kind. Well, there's some things about it. Mary was an obedient and blessed woman. The Bible says so of her. But she was no goddess. She was not a goddess. Mary's no goddess. <clears throat> I don't think she'd be happy knowing people were worshiping her. <clears throat> she was in the upper room with the rest of the apostles getting the Holy Ghost. Amen. She was not miraculously assumed into heaven either. Mary was only a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus. All right. Basically, after him, she lived a normal married life and had children. And we know that she had children because in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, people said, Is not this carpenter talking of Jesus, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Now, take a look at this. After Jesus, she had four more boys and some sisters. Jesus was part of a very large family. He was the oldest of a very, very large family. That's pretty amazing. Mary lived a normal life. It's like any other woman. There's no disgrace in that. There's no stopping her from being an obedient and blessed woman because she lived a normal married life. Goodness gracious. I mean, the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor in the Lord. So she was obviously a blessing to Joseph and in and, and so many ways a blessing because she blessed him with lots of progeny. I mean, Jesus was not his natural son, but certainly James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon were. So she had uh, a wonderful, wonderful life uh, of, uh, with lots and lots of children. Uh, Jesus was the first. That's when she was a virgin. Amen. And the history of icono iconography, <clears throat> basically the worship of icons and statues in the Roman Catholic Church, and in the Greek Orthodox Church, by the way, uh, those two churches split uh, in the, what was known as the Great Schism. I think it was uh, 1052, somewhere, and don't, don't quote me on the year, but I know it was somewhere in the 11th century, uh, that they split um, and became two persons. The, the head of the Greek Orthodox Church is called the Patriarch, and the head of the Roman Catholic Church is called the Pope, basically Papa. Uh, and the, uh, the Patriarch, uh, basically, uh, they celebrate Christmas, I think, on January 7th. Uh, after after December uh, after December twenty fifth, Amen. So basically, that's not the now. Basically, the church tells us that statues and icons were originally used to remind people of Bible stories and verses because the people were illiterate and the Bible was not easy to obtain. You know, we always have to remember that for a very very long time in the history of Christ Christianity, the Bible was not easy to get. All right, it was put together. Uh, basically, the canon was assembled a sort of a, you know, by not by committee, but kind of a general agreement with the books that we now consider uh, the canon of the New Testament, C-A-N-O-N, -N. not the canon of the explosives, but the canon is a, is a collection of historical books. And it was, uh, it was later codified. Uh, and uh, when the the Latin Vulgate was put together, it was written in stone, so to speak. But people didn't have access to it, and a lot of people were illiterate. And they would put up the the statues and the stained glass so that people would be would learn the stories of the Bible without having to read the scriptures, right? And uh, that might be a little problematic. But you know, eventually, as in the case today. The worship of statues continues. That became part and parcel of the experience, you know. And now, you know, again, the Bible prohibits idol worship, uh, which would include veneration of the so-called saints. Okay, uh, the 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 Roman Catholic Church uses that word veneration, 
as if to say, well, that means more respect than it's worship, but it also means worship. And they're bowing down to statues and lighting candles. Basically, that's idol worship. No matter, it doesn't, you know, the whole thing, oh, they just remind us. Well, remind you of what? I mean, these saints and Mary are all dead awaiting the resurrection. There's only one you should worship. That's just Jesus. And you don't need a statue to do it. You don't want a statue to do it because God forbid you, forbid that of you. Amen. And this is what, this is what people are locked into, you know, and they, uh, you know, it's, it's a shame that people are so dedicated to this. Uh, when they need to put it behind them, because it's uh, it's forbidden in the in the in the in the book, you know, in the commandments, God forbade that. Amen. All right, John two eight, Jonah, excuse me, two eight says, "Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love." Wow, that's powerful. Those who pay regard. This is Jonah chapter two verse eight from the ESV. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. That's a very, very powerful scripture uh, against the worship of idols. Amen. Let's look at something else now. Idol worship stars of stage and screen. I have a picture of Taylor Swift. I'm not picking on her. But the reason I have a picture of her is that she's probably the most famous American entertainer right now. Uh, so, you know, she's on the, in the news all the time. Uh, so I thought I would just include her. I'm not picking on her. Amen. The people who become stars, have you ever noticed that they're also called idols? I, you, you think there's any, you think this, th th that's kind of, whoa, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, they are labeled as idols. So why should we see them any differently? Why should we see them every, any differently? They're labeled as idols. Many people, especially young people, get their cues on how to live their lives based on the lifestyles and musings of these stars. Okay, here, quote here, from an article written by someone named Upasana Puri. It's in an online site called Medium. She says this. this is, these are Puri's words. Quote, she, talking about Taylor Swift, is more than just an artist. She's an idol to many of us. She doesn't mock our emotions, but transforms them into beautifully crafted lyrics that make us feel seen and heard. She inspires us to be a better version of ourselves, not only through her music, but also through her real life persona. Mm. Sounds to me like she's being worshiped here. The Bible tells us to follow Jesus and be perfect. And here people are following Taylor Swift and being transformed, changed by inter interaction with her. That's exactly what an idol does. <clears throat> you know, worship requires sacrifice and giving, and that's what they're absolutely doing. Amen. The stars of stage and screen mean more to people than God today. And that was borne out by a man named John Lennon, who was part of the Beatles, when he said, basically, we meant more to kids than Jesus did. I paraphrase that. <coughs> Excuse me, where he said, we were more influential to kids than Jesus. <clears throat> he tried to clarify that. But in fact, it was true. Uh, the Beatles meant more to kids than Jesus did. So they were getting their cues on their behavior and how they should live their lives from the Beatles. <clears throat> now, what about that statement was not true or is not true today? Hmm. Seems to be resonate. <clears throat> Amen. Idol worship extends then to the worship performers. <laughs> performers are worshiped as idols and treated differently. Amen. All right, now let's move to idol worship. I'm spelling it differently. Instead of I D O L. I-D-L-E, idol worship. And let's define that. Uh, idol worship covers basically two areas. Number one, idol worship is the worship of the things of the flesh and lazy or ungodly worship. <clears throat> idol worship is the worship of false deities without the worship of idols. Okay, I-D-O-L-S. So worship of false deities, but you don't have an idol when you worship this deity. And I'll tell you what that is. That's an idea or a concept, amen, but you basically, I, you basically deified it, made it God, 
essentially. And let's talk about that because uh, idol worship in the flesh. I have a picture of a man who's smoking a cigar. He's lit in his, he's, he has lit his cigar with a $100 bill, right? So he's very prideful, obviously has a lot of money. First John 2.16, John told us this. You know this well. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Bible, the King James puts it this way, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Uh, basically, worship of the desires of the flesh include promiscuity, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, gluttony, physical idleness, physical idleness afforded by wealth. Amen. Amen. So all these things then become desires of the flesh and their idol worship, right? Amen. And sin, indeed, worship of the eyes include the lust for money, jewelry, expensive homes, cars, boats, etc. There's nothing wrong with having money or a nice home, you know, or godly jewelry or cars or boats. Nothing wrong with it. But we see so many people in the throes of excess, they absolutely worship these things. They want these things. They have to have these things. There's just a lust for them. The lusts of the eyes, what they see they want. All right? Also, worship of pride includes the desire for fame, fortune, and power over people. The gentleman in this picture, I have no backstory for him. I have no idea what he's doing. He just might be doing something silly and it got on the internet. Uh, it could be an advertisement. I don't know. But I thought it was a good picture of someone who is so rich and has so much power um, that um, he's just flaunting it. He's saying, I'm greater than everybody else because I can light my cigar with a $100 bill. I'm I'm, I've got so much fortune, uh, and it makes him prideful. The money isn't really what he's after. He's after the pride that comes with the money. Okay. So that's how we boil down these three things, the worship of the, the desires of the flesh, the desires, of the eyes and the pride of life. That's how we boil these three things down, how they manifest in our lives. And these, all of these things can become a God to us. And it all depends on priorities. I'm going to talk about that. Which all, all depends on our priorities, what we make as number one. Okay, let's take a look at idol worship Islam. I did not include Islam in IDOL worship because they don't worship an idol, or maybe they do. But let's take a look. I have a picture here. I'm going to explain this in a minute. Amen. The Muslim deity Allah is not the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Make no mistake about that. That God is not the same. Yah Allah simply means God. And uh, I asked, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I ask, generally ask Muslims, what is Allah's name? Allah has no name. Our God has a name. Anything living has a name, right? But Allah is not the Yahweh of the, of the Old Testament or revealed in Jesus in the New. They do not believe God was manifest in the flesh, Jesus. They believe they have a more theist position that God is not interested in the running in the affairs of human beings, that we have to reach ourselves to his level <clears throat> through all sorts of different means, following the five pillars, one of which I'll talk about in a second. And here's the reality about it. As many as 48,000 terror attacks by Muslims between 1979 and 2021, resulting in the deaths of over 200,000 people. 48,000, that's, that, that's a rounding off. There's more than that. But about as many as 48,000 terror attacks by Muslims between 1979 and 2021. So we see how this, the, the worship of this deity tends to violence. Okay, it tends to violence. And our God has told us to live peaceably with all men if it's possible. Follow peace with all men. Pray for our enemies. One of the five pillars of Islam requires a Muslim to visit Mecca once in his or her life. At Mecca, they line up and touch what's called the black stone, which they 
they believe will remit sins. They're touching a thing and believing that thing has the power to remit sins. Now, a religion that's so concerned and adamant that God did not walk among us in Jesus Christ and die on the cross so that we could have our sins forgiven through baptism in his name, and they say they how they really say well God can't be involved in the physical aspects of the world like that. Yet they see this stone having divine powers. No one can forgive sin but God, so this stone has to be God in it. Well, God doesn't live in a stone. Amen. Because Psalm eighteen two says the Lord is my rock, Yahweh is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God my rock in whom I will take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. You know, God put that there, that not by accident. He knew Islam would rise up someday, and he wanted to put make sure that the real rock is Jesus. Amen. Not a black rock. All right. How is the worship of, of a plain old stone then? Not idol worship, I-D-O-L. Amen. Idol worship is the worship that gets you nowhere, I-D-L-E. And idol worship, they're kind, of, they're kind of linked here. Basically, here's what they believe about the stone. The Muslims believe the stone was given to Adam to remit sins, and it, was, and it was originally white, but it became black after it remitted sins of so many Muslims. So it's black because of all the sins that are in it. I mean, this is absolutely full. They, they line up, or they, they walk around this huge building, and then eventually they get to the place where they put their hands on the stone. This is what they have to do once in their life. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Idol worship Judaism. I'm going to talk about it. I know it's not popular. Look, I'm very pro-Jewish. You know that. You know that I am. But I have to I have to call it like, like the Bible sees it. Make no mistake, the Jews are God-chosen people. There's no question about that. And, you know, the fact that uh, Jews have been persecuted so much over the years is not right. Not right. It's ungodly. However, absent the revelation of Yeshua as Moshiach, basically Jesus as Messiah or as Christ, their worship is idle, I-D-L-E. If they don't have the revelation of Jesus, then their, their, their worship is basically meaningless. John 3.18 says, Whoever believes in him, in Jesus, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's what the Bible says, all right? That's not me, but that's what the Bible says, all right? Uh, basically, we pray that the Jews will come to the knowledge of God in Christ, as many have. We believe there will be a remnant, amen? But the attempt to worship Yahweh without Yeshua is an exercise in futility. Again, you know, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So. Jesus has to be the component at worship. Amen. So we need to pray that Muslims and Jews alike will come to the revelation that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Amen. Idol worship mainstream Christianity. I have a picture of a church outside of this church. There is what is the pride flag with the trans stuff on it, and then a flag that says Black Lives Matter. Amen. And why the, why are these important? Why the, well John 4:24 basically said God is a spirit, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? One worships God idly when one worships an empty deity. All right? In 1 Corinthians 6:9 Paul said, "Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived." be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. This is something he wrote. So basically that flag, you can't go in the, and pretend you're worshiping God when that flag, when, you're, when you see yourself in that flag and you live your lifestyle according to what that flag represents, no good. Uh, basically, the sign outside the church, instead of saying Black Lives Matter, because that's a very political thing, and I, I believe Black Lives Matter, no problem with that. But what I believe more than anything else is all souls matter. 
That should be the sign out there. All souls matter. Amen. Because the day is going to come, saints, when we're going to shed this earthly coil. Amen. Our souls, we need to be on fire for the Lord. And, uh, you know, it's not going to matter what color our skin is because our souls are all the same color. Hallelujah. So all souls matter. That's the way I see it. Amen. I don't want to see people killed because they're a certain color of skin or, or persecuted because they have a certain color of skin. That's not right. I don't want to be persecuted. I couldn't help the skin I was born in. No, nobody can help the skin they're born in. Amen. There's no reason to persecute somebody for that things they can't change. Amen. Um, but without transformation and deliverance from sin, basically a church has no power, has no power at all. Amen. Without the born again experience, the church is not saved. Can't be saved if you're not born again in water and the spirit. That's what the Bible says. I go by the Bible, not about signs and flags that are hung outside of a church. Amen. Idol worship the lazy Christian. I have a picture of a man sitting in church looking at his cell phone. Obviously, he's not looking, you know, now a lot of people look at their cell phones in church. I understand that because we all have the scriptures on our cell phones. You know, I, I think, I mean, that's great, but you know, part of the, part of the witness for Christians used to be going to church with your Bible under your arm. I remember in the city, I have walking around my Bible. This is what I live, man. You know, people look at that Bible and look at you carrying it. It looks different from all other books. And so you're sending a message of who you are right away that everybody has a cell phone. They don't know whether there's a Bible on it or not. Amen. James 4, 17, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. To him it is sin. We cannot worship God halfway. That's idol worship, I-D-L-E worship. We worship idly, right? Our worship must be focused on working out our own salvation daily. As the scripture says this, it says in Philippians 2, 12, wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as, on, only, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This guy in church has no fear, and he sure ain't trembling. And we don't want to be like that. We want our worship to be solely dedicated to the Lord. Matthew 19, 21 to 22, Jesus said, if you would be perfect, he said this to the rich young, the young rich man, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, because he had great possessions. So there are things that get in the way of our worship of the Lord. These are our idol worship, but they become idols. Power, money, lust, these things become idols to us when they become our number one. Amen. God needs to be number one in our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. The priority list, how not to be an idol or an idol worshiper. Avoid both. Okay, let's take a look. Have a good priority list. Basically, Deuteronomy 6, 4, 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Amen. That's the priority. God has to be number one no matter what. Can't make your wife or husband number one. Can't make your children number one. Can't make your job number one. Can't make lust number one. Power number one. Ganesh number one. Shiva number one. Uh, can't make Allah number one. Can't make any of these number one. And the only number one, I can't make Mary number one. Jesus has to be number one. Your Lord, your God has to be number one. And, I, you know, a lot of people, sometimes they get upset when you talk about the, uh, you know, people in marriage say, well, you know, my, my children are number one. Uh, no, no, you make God, God number one because without God, you're in trouble. Amen. Because Mark 12, 29, 30, uh, Jesus also said here, the more important commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So he reiterates this command that God has to be number one no matter what. The number one priority in our lives must be God. Amen. And the reason is because if you if you want to be good to your family and to your children and all the things that you have down on your priority list, whatever's number two, three, four, five, ten, twenty down on your list, you have to remember this scripture that Jesus said in John 15, verses four to five. He said, Abide in me 
and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You cannot be a good husband or wife if God is not number one. You cannot be a good father or mother if God is not number one. You cannot be a good worker if God is not number one. You cannot be a good friend if God is not number one. You cannot be a good neighbor if God is not number one. Hallelujah. God has to be the top priority in our lives no matter what. Praise the name of the living God. Hallelujah. Amen. What is our reasonable service? I have a picture here, amen, of a man carrying a cross. And that's the, that, I don't even need to put scriptures up. That says it as it is. Matthew 16, 24, 25, Jesus told his disciples, if any, anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Amen. Romans 12, chapter chapter 12, excuse me, verses 1 to 2, Paul said this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your, your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our reasonable service. This is what we're supposed to do, to take up our cross and follow him. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the living God. Glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Worship Jesus and no one or nothing else. I have a picture here of people at a concert, and they are just got their hands lifted up. So tell me, are they worshiping or not? Looks to me like they are. Looks an awful lot like a Pentecostal church, except, you know, people aren't praising God. They're praising the people on the stage. <clears throat> so how do you like them apples? Amen. Worship Jesus and no one and nothing else. Praise God. Brother Casey, would you give us a song in closing tonight? Mm -hmm. 